Go ahead, Ed. Okay, if we could turn, please, in our Bibles to the book of Revelation and the second chapter. We're going to read uh, the shortest of the seven letters this morning, letter to the church at Smyrna from verses 8 through 11. And we're going to look uh, at the suffering church. We saw the loveless church last time. They left their first love. Now we're going to see the suffering church. And we're going to begin in verse 8. It says, unto the angel of the church in Smyrna, write these things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison that you may be tried and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. And again, God will bless that reading of his precious word to us this morning. What I want to do before we look at this suffering church is, we said that we were going to look at the churches in three ways. We're going to look at them as to what the letter meant to the original recipients who were real believers uh, going through real difficulties in their own day. And then we were going to make application to churches in any day, our day particularly, how we might be affected by these things. Could we leave our first love like the church at Ephesus? Of course we could. And then we said, thirdly, that there's a historical aspect to these churches, like a church history curriculum in advance. And I want to take up that particular aspect uh, a little bit uh, this morning concerning Ephesus. Although we looked at Ephesus last time, we didn't look at it from a church history perspective, and I want to do that. But let me just do a few things first. Um, I want to give a quotation from uh, Mr. Darby, John Nelson Darby, uh, concerning these churches. This is what he says, I have no doubt that this series of churches applies as history to the moral successive state of the whole church. The first four to the history of the church at Rome from its first decline to its present conditions in popery. So the first four churches kind of showing the development of popery uh, from its initial decline of the original church to how it became what we know it today. Uh, and then uh, he says, uh, the last three are the history of Protestantism. So that's just interesting to think of uh, how Darby viewed that. Uh, it does make an interesting study. I think there are three things that are really good to study uh, together. Leviticus 23, the Feasts of Israel, which is really a prophetic history of Israel um, from its inception as a nation uh, to the very end of history, when it will reign with Christ in the millennial kingdom. Matthew 13, uh, again, is a history of the kingdom from the time when the king was rejected uh, to the time when he will indeed reign in righteousness. And so these three, they kind of trace uh, history of the nation of Israel, of the kingdom of God, and then <clears throat> these seven churches, the history of the church. And the idea is this, that God, who is all wise and all knowing, knows everything in advance. And, and so we have uh, his, as it were, giving us a church history curriculum uh, before any of it had happened. And so when you combine these three, you have God's complete program revealed to Israel, the church, and for the kingdom. And T. Ernest Wilson, a great scholar, man of God, said that these are essential frameworks for understanding the scriptures. If you want to really get the backbone of understanding the word of God, these three things, these three areas would be very helpful. And if I would add anything to Mr. Uh, Wilson, I would say also the seven dispensations and the, se and the covenants of scripture uh, are also very helpful in getting that overall framework for the word of God. But I want you just to think for a moment in terms of looking at it from a church history perspective, curriculum written in advance perspective by an all-knowing God. If time travel was possible, 
I want you to imagine New Testament saints like Tychicus, Gaius, Secundus, <clears throat> visiting the Maritimes or your area in 2023. <clears throat> so by tri time travel, they've gone from the New Testament, suddenly they arrive, and they, they spend a year going around visiting every place that has the word church attached to it. And they go to these different churches. And I would think that what they might say is, how did they ever get here <laughs> to where it is today from here where we started back in the first century? Like, how did that happen? How did all these denominations, where did all they come from? All these aberrations, where did they all come from? And of course, the answer is given to us in church history. Church history explains how we got from the New Testament church to the church of the present day. And it really kind of helps us to understand all these little developments. And so <clears throat> church history in some ways is a bit like Israel's history. There's departure, and then there's recovery. Now, the recovery is never to the exact beginning, uh, but there's measures of recovery along the way. And certainly we saw that in Israel's history. We see it in the history of the church. So when we look at Ephesus, and we're just going to look at it from a historical perspective briefly this morning, uh, and then we're going to go on to Smyrna. But we saw it as the backsliding church, the church that had left its first love. And we, we kind of be, it really covers a period from Pentecost to 100 AD, really the first 100 years, uh, if you like. Well, not even 100 years, first 70 years of the church. Where do we get that when we look at uh, Ephesians, uh, Revelation 2 and Ephesians, the church at Ephesus. Well, notice it's the only church that mentions apostles. Now, in this case, they're false apostles. Uh, we saw that in verse 2. Uh, he says, uh, <clears throat> thou hast tried them which say they're apostles and are not and has found them liars. And so, obviously, if there were false apostles, it must have been in a day when there was real apostles. And the apostles were given for the foundation of the church, Ephesians 2.20. Church is built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. And so it would seem that this church looks at that period when uh, the early days of the church, when apostles were still uh, in uh, working, and of course that takes up to 100 uh, when John, the last apostle, dies. Now, during that time period, there was rapid gospel expansion, and I think it's interesting to notice that the gospel spread from Jerusalem as far as Britain, North Africa, which at that time would have been 80% Christian uh, in the early, it's hard to imagine that now uh, because it's so Muslim, but uh, by, it's interesting that by 100 AD, the population of believers in the world was 0.0017%, about 10,000. So they went from 120 in that upper room on the day of Pentecost in the first 70 years to around 10,000 believers. When we get to 300 AD, We've gone from 0.0017% of the population to 10.5% of the population, approximately 6 million. <laughs> and so it's just kind of interesting to see how quickly the church spread in the first three centuries. But we're thinking of the first, uh, you know, kind of period up to 100 AD. Why was there such rapid expansion? How did the gospel spread so quickly? Well, there's different reasons. We, we've probably highlighted this in other times, but one of them was um, the uh, it was the fullness of the times. Uh, when the Lord Jesus came, it was at the perfect time for the dissemination of the gospel. Uh, when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law. And so what were some of the things that made it so uh, appropriate for the coming of the Messiah? Well, one of them was Roman roads. 50,000 miles, sorry, I don't know what that is in kilometers, but it's a lot, <laughs> probably about 70,000 kilometers, something like that, of straight roads dissecting the empire, made for the easy spread of the gospel. They had a good uh, highway system. 
I remember in England uh, going up to Hadrian's Wall, which was kind of the, the northernmost outpost of the Roman Empire. And there was there were straight roads, still Roman roads that you could actually walk on that still are standing to this day. They were pretty marvelous engineers. And so just amazing, these roads. Secondly, what we call the Pax Romana. Uh, there was the, the Roman peace. There was law and order. Strong government brought law and order, which made it easy to travel and be basically unmolested because of the, the, the security of the Roman Empire. So great law and order, strong government. And then uh, another thing that made for the spread of the gospel was the Greek language. Uh, this was the language of trade, of business, and the New Testament was written in that language. It made it very easy to disseminate because it was a language that everybody spoke, same as uh, today. English is the international business language of the world. And so it's in some ways, English is very advantageous. Uh, you go to places, go to Norway, I can preach in English because most of the Norwegian people speak English, no difficulty. And you can do that in most places apart from Quebec. You can't do that in Quebec, but you can do it in most places. Just joking. But you can do it in most places in the world. It's amazing. Also, there was great disillusionment with paganism and Greek philosophy. There was there was kind of a, a a void, a vacuum. People realized that this this is bankrupt. It was a bankrupt system, and so people were looking for hope. They were looking for answers, and uh, so it really was a, a great opportune time for the spread of the gospel. But during this time, they largely were able to keep heresy at bay. No major heresies. They, the, the things that were coming in, for instance, like Gnosticism, the apostles were able to deal with that very clearly in books like Colossians, uh, where they were able to, as it were, uh, kind of nip, nip it in the bud and deal with a lot of these errors. And so heresy was largely kept to be. But the one thing that I want to bring before us is the rise of what we call the, the deeds of the Nicolaitans. This idea of conquering the people, the rise of what we know as the clergy laity system. And so I just want to show where this comes from. So here's an example. I want to quote from the writings of Ignatius. Now, he lived from AD 35 to AD 107. So he's right in this time frame, right in this, uh, the early church. He was one of those known as the early apostolic fathers, uh, along with others like Clement and Polycarp and uh, uh, this man Ignatius, Barnabas, they were the immediate followers of the inspired apostles. They had known several of the apostles, and this man was the Bishop of Antioch, and he was martyred in Rome, being dragged to Rome as fast as possible to be thrown to the lions during the last day of the games. So he, he laid down his life for the cause of Christ. But to this man Ignatius, what we call Episcopalianism, which is found in the Anglican Church and also in the Catholic Church, really, uh, it owes everything to Ignatius of Antioch. He gives the bishop a prominence and authority unknown in the New Testament. So I'm going to just give you some of his quotes. Why did Nicolaitanism arise? How did it come about? His commentary on Acts 20, verse 17 and verse 28 where it talks about the Holy Ghost raising up overseers and uh, Paul calling for the elders. He says that Paul sent from Miletus to Ephesus and called the bishops and presbyters, thus making two titles of one, one person. So now you've got bishops and you've got presbyters. And so he made that distinction. And he says they, they were from Ephesus and neighboring cities, thus obscuring the fact that one church, Ephesus, had several overseers and bishops. So this is where they get it from, you see. This is how it comes about. Some extracts from his writings. To the church at Ephesus, let us take heed, brethren, that we set not ourselves against the bishop, that we might be subject to God. It is therefore evident that we ought to look upon the bishop even as we do upon the Lord himself. 
Now, isn't that a statement? Look upon the bishop as if he was the Lord himself. And yet, what does Peter say in 1 Peter 5? Not lording it over the Lord's heritage, <laughs> you see. And yet, we look at uh, this is his letter to the Magnesians. I exhort that you study to all things in divine concord, your bishops presiding in the place of God, your presbyters in the place of the council of the apostles, and your deacons, most dear to me, being entrust, entrusted with the ministry of Jesus Christ. So again, you bishops in the place of God, presbyters or elders in the place of the apostles, and then deacons uh, entrusted with the ministry of Jesus Christ. And so you can see how quickly these things developed. And so this man responsible for how we get to be where we are today with, with the bishops of the Church of England, the Church of Rome, and all the rest of it. That's where it comes from. So now let's move on to Smyrna. And now we want to look at Smyrna, not from a historical point of view. We want to look at it just as, as it was written to the original recipients and how it might apply to believers today uh, in Smyrna conditions around the world. And of course, it's the persecuted church. Smyrna was 35 miles north of Ephesus. And sorry, I've not done a good job with the kilometer thing today, but about 50 kilometers, I'm guessing, north of Ephesus. With a superior harbor than Ephesus, it was a commercial center, prospered under Rome, and traded in wines, as it had beautiful farming land surrounding the city. Population was around 100,000, and it still exists today. You can actually go to Smyrna, although it's named Izmir in Turkey, but still exists to this day. There's still a, a, a population there. It had been destroyed in the past but had been rebuilt by Alexander the Great. Of course, Turkey notorious for earthquakes, as we well know from recent events, and had been destroyed previously by an earthquake, had been rebuilt by Alexander the Great. It was a model of well -plan a well-planned city. Wide straight streets ran through the city. The most famous street was called the Golden Street. And this Golden Street, it had a temple at either end. The Temple of Cybele, uh, <clears throat> Cybele at one end, the harbor end, and the Temple of Zeus at the other end, and temples in between the two. So it was a very pagan city. Uh, Smyrna was aligned fully with Rome and was the first place in the Roman Empire to actually build a temple to Rome and to its emperors, Dea Roma. And this was in 195 BC. So the very first place to build a temple uh, to dedicate it to Rome and the worship of the empire and the emperor. And the early emperors of Rome shunned worship, but in time it was accepted and even became mandatory, seen as unite a uniting thing, a way that to hold people together was their common allegiance to the emperor and to the empire. And Domitian, uh, the one who John is writing under, the one who, because of Domitian, he's exiled uh, to uh, Patmos, he was the one who took this final step. It became necessary to burn a pinch of incense on an altar to Caesar. And once you did that, a certificate of loyalty was issued to say that you were a loyal citizen of the empire. To refuse, you were considered to be disloyal. And of course, the Christians had a great difficulty with acknowledging, as they burned that piece of incense, acknowledging Caesar as Lord, because they owned a different Lord, Jesus as Lord. And so because they refused to do this, the Christians became the objects of crushing persecution. And as we said, Smyrna was the first place that this temple uh, to Rome was ever built. And therefore, even though the, there may not have been such persecution in other parts of the empire, why is he just writing to this one 
a church about persecution, it's because the temple to Rome was there. They were the first and they were the loyal uh, adherents of Rome. And so when Domitian issued this decree that incense had to be burned, it was strictly enforced in Smyrna and it was a very hard place to be a believer. And of course, we know there are some very hard places in our world to be a believer today. Uh, it's a hard place to be a believer in North Korea because you have a very similar thing. There's worship of the rulers, the ruling family. They're worshipped as living deities. And if you have allegiance to somebody else, uh, well, you get sent to camps and all kinds of difficulties that you would experience. So again, in verse eight, it says to the angel of the church in Smyrna. Now the word Smyrna uh, actually is derived from the word myrrh. And we know about myrrh in our Bibles, a burial ointment used in embalming and symbolic of death, uh, cr crushed uh, in order for its true fragrance to come out in all of its fullness. Uh, this is what myrrh is. And the Christians were being crushed by persecution, but a beautiful fragrance was coming from them. It's interesting that myrrh is used at the beginning of the Gospels and at the end of the Gospels. Uh, it's used in Matthew's Gospel, and we're all very familiar with this, but the, the gifts of the wise men, uh, when they came, uh, having seen the star uh, from afar, they, they followed the star and they came to visit uh, the the one who would be the king and the messiah and it says in verse 11 when they were come into the house they saw the young child with mary his mother and fell down and worshiped him notice they, they worshiped him they didn't worship mary they fell down and worshiped him and when they had opened their treasures they presented him gifts gold frankincense and myrrh and again i i can't imagine turning up to a, uh, uh, a dedication of a, a newborn baby and bringing burial ointment along as a gift. Uh, that would be uh, somewhat strange, but it, it certainly was very fitting, uh, as we'll see in a moment. Also, not only bought by the wise men, but also was brought by Nicodemus at the burial of the Lord Jesus, as we well know, John's Gospel, chapter 19. So as we reach the end of the Gospel accounts, we read about myrrh again, John 19 and verse 39. And there came also Nicodemus, which at the first came to Jesus by night and brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pounds weight. And then there's one other reference to myrrh that is significant to us. And that is that it was part of the anointing oil for the anointing of the high priest. Remember when they were anointed back in Exodus chapter 30. The book of Exodus, chapter 30, and verse 23. And let me just read that. Exodus 30, verse 23, where we read this, the ingredients of this. Uh, verse 22, moreover, the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Take thou also unto the principal spices of pure myrrh, 500 shekels, and of sweet cinnamon, half so much, even 250 shekels, and of sweet calamus, 250 shekels, and of cassia, 500 shekels, after the shekel of the sanctuary, and of oil, olive, and hin. And thou shalt make it an holy ointment, an ointment compounded after the art of the apothecary, it shall be a holy anointing oil. And of course, that was used for the anointing of the high priest. And so let's just kind of put those three references to myrrh together the lord jesus was that suffering man who had come into the world and died introduced at his birth introduced at his death and was buried but now as our great high priest remember he was anointed with oil of gladness above his fellows he is now the one that ministers in the presence of god for us in the power of a fragrant endless life anointed with that oil of gladness so even in the presence of god is that aroma of myrrh on our great high priest so very fitting uh, that this church uh, is is in a city that is named after myrrh not just that uh, we've also observed that it's the shortest letters 
uh, letter to the seven of the of the seven, letters to the seven churches, and contains no rebuke. And when people are suffering and dying, brevity and clarity is needed. <laughs> you go to somebody and they're dying; uh, it's not the time to give your lengthiest sermon to them. They just need a few words of comfort that they can cling hold of. And so we need to understand that practical lesson here. When you're dealing with the suffering and the dying, be brief. Uh, don't uh, give them a lengthy doctrinal exposition. They just need some words of comfort for their soul in the midst of their trials. And it needs to be brief and it needs to be clear. And that's what we see in this letter. The Lord is very brief, very clear as he speaks to them. And so how does he introduce himself? Well, he says, unto the angel of the church in Smyrna write, these things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. First of all, he says, I am the first and the last. Remember, Smyrna was the first place in emperor worship, but the Lord Jesus is the first in everything. <laughs> He's the first. He's the, uh, you know, the first of, of everything. Uh, and so, He's the first and he's the last. And again, very important for them to realize this. Yeah, he's the God who is in control. He's the eternal one, first and the last. Caesars will one day pass away, but the one who is the first and the last, he will always be. And so the one they belong to is the Lord of history. He's the first and the last. He's revealed who is also the one who is no stranger to suffering. If anybody can empathize with these people, it is the Lord Jesus. He says not only is he the first and the last, but he says he is the one which was dead. And how did he die? Well, Christ, he suffered. He, 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 he knows what it was to have the mob against him. He knows what it is uh, to uh, be treated despicably. And so he, the description reminded them of things about the Lord that they maybe had forgotten or needed to be made more aware of. Maybe they needed this focus. Look, the one that they're worshiping, the one that they're serving, the one that they're suffering for has himself suffered greatly. The one which was dead at the hands of the hostile mob. But then he wants them to, to know this too, but he is alive. Indeed, he is the one who conquered death and has authority over death. Interesting in these seven churches, this is the only real reference to Calvary, the one who was dead or became dead. And interestingly enough that in this letter, death is mentioned three times uh, in the short few verses. And it's, it's interesting how it's mentioned, as we see here, of the Lord himself, that he was the one which was dead. And then it's also mentioned of the death of the saint, uh, because it, it talks about, verse 10, fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that you may be tried. You shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death. And so some of the Christians in Smyrna were going to face death, and he encourages them to be faithful unto death, and I'll give you the crown of life. So there's the death of the Savior, there's the death of the saint. Some of them are going to die for the Lord Jesus as martyrs. And then finally, there's a reference to the death of the sinner, because notice verse 11, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church is, he that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. Now, who will be hurt of the second death? Well, it's the one who doesn't believe in the Lord Jesus, isn't it? Uh, the one who's not born twice, right? If you're born twice, you die once. You don't experience the second death. But if you're born once, you don't have the second birth, you'll die twice. You'll die physically, and then you will die in the second death, which is eternal separation from God. And so ironically, in this letter, short, brief, 
three references to death, the death of the saint, the death of the sinner. And what makes the difference between the two, between the death of the saint and the death of the sin? Well, it's the death of the Savior, isn't it? It's because he died and was buried and rose again that the sinner becomes the saint and does not have to fear the second death. It's the one, the uh, death of the Lord Jesus on whom eternal destinies depend. Accept him, believe on him, trust in his finished work. You'll never be hurt of the second death. Reject him. And then the second death is assured. It's a certainty for you. And then notice he says in verse 9, I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they're Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. It's wonderful to, to know that whatever we're going through, the Lord knows all about it. And he wants them to know. I know. I know what, how you're serving me. I, I know what you're suffering for me. I, I know your poverty. I know everything you're going through. He knew all about it. He had experienced it all and more himself, but he also knew what they were going through. Uh, there's a great identification with the Lord and with his people here. You see, he knew the pressure that they were going through because he'd experienced that pressure in Gethsemane, the olive press. He knew what it was to be under pressure because the, 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 the word tribulation here is, has the idea of, of pressure, tremendous pressure that's put upon these people. Uh, it, it, that's what it really means that the Greek word for, for, for tribulation uh, that's used here it has the idea of great pressure. And the Lord knows that he also knew poverty. Uh, he knew what it was to be blasphemed. He talks about the blasphemy of those which say there are Jews and are not. He knew what it was to be blasphemed, and uh, he ex he could identify with these people in every sense of the word. The word poverty, actually, that's used here is a very strong Greek word. It means abject poverty, destitution. And how could that be? I mean, they're in the Roman Empire. They're in one of the most uh, vibrant cities in terms of commercial success. And yet, because they were considered disloyal, what would that mean for them? Well, it would mean loss of jobs. It would mean loss of place in society. It would mean being disowned by family. They couldn't buy from stores, uh, couldn't be hired. It would mean that they were really destitute. And so the Lord says, I, I know that. I, I know the pressure you're under. I know the poverty that you're experiencing I, I know that you're still serving me in the midst of it. I know thy works. But he says, but you're rich. How the Lord Jesus defines riches is clearly very different from how the prosperity gospel people views riches. <laughs> uh, in, in fact, could I, could I say this? Prosperity gospel preachers are an affront to the suffering Christians in Smyrna and around the world. Uh, their teaching is, is an abomination to these people. They're suffering tremendously. And yet the Lord says, you guys are really rich. In what sense were they rich? Because we, want, we need the Lord to define what riches are. Later on, we're going to see people who thought they were rich, but they were really poor. Here are people who are really poor, but the Lord says, you're really rich. And so, obviously, he has to define for us what it means to be rich. You know, we are rich spiritually. Ephesians 1, verse 3, we know it well. We've been blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Oh, we're rich. We're greatly blessed in many ways. Our spiritual blessings, our inheritance laid up in heaven for us that cannot be touched, uh, cannot in any way uh, be lost. Uh, how blessed we are. But how does the Lord say that these people are rich? Well, could it be they're rich because they are so like the Savior in so many ways? You see, they were poor. Well, he was poor. 
though though he was rich yet for our sakes he became poor uh, and he, he didn't know where to lay his head he knew what it was to experience poverty they were like him in that he suffered rejection they also had suffered rejection he suffered attacks from the devil they also suffered attacks from the devil uh, and even the synagogue you notice synagogue of satan where what happened when he went to his own synagogue they tried to throw him off the cliff uh, he 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 was faithful to his father just as they were being faithful to him despite opposition and rejection some of them face prison the lord jesus was taken from prison and from judgment he overcame death and some of them would also experience death and overcome it and so in what way were they rich well they were rich because they resembled the savior beautifully that's how they were rich and so he says uh, but thou art rich yeah you may <laughs> be in tribulation and poverty but then he says i know the blasphemy of them which say there are jews and they are not but are the synagogue of satan now remember the idea of jews comes from judah which means praise and he's describing a group of people who were clearly descendants of judah but they're not living in a way that brings any praise to god at all in fact brings disgrace to god they're guilty of blasphemy i know the blasphemy of them which say they're jews and they're not and of course who would they be blaspheming it certainly wouldn't be uh the uh the god of israel but they were blaspheming the name of the lord jesus and the followers of the lord jesus it was that lovely name the name of christ that they were blaspheming so they're being blasphemed by those who claim to be jews there was a large jewish population in smyrna and they used all their powers to hurt christians and they were recognized by rome as a religion and exempted actually from caesar worship so they didn't they didn't face the same problem the christians faced jesus declared their synagogue as a synagogue of satan now that may seem hard but remember how the lord uh, addressed the pharisees of his day in john's gospel chapter 8 and in verse um, 44 he says you are of your father the devil and the lusts of your father you will do he was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there's no truth in him when he speaketh a lie he speaketh of his own for he is a liar and the father of it and because i tell you the truth you believe me not and so the lord himself called these uh pharisees of his day who would have been loyal attendants at the synagogue and the temple and very religious but he says you are of your father the devil and now here we see here's uh in this city of smyrna there's a synagogue of satan claiming they're jews but they're not bringing praise to god at all so notice we have the enemy mentioned twice in this letter uh, we see him uh, as revealed as connected with the synagogue of satan and then we see him in verse 10 with the name the devil fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer behold the devil shall cast some of you into prison that you may be tried and you shall have tribulation 10 days be faithful to death i'll give you the crown of life and so we have him mentioned first of all as satan and then as the devil so what is the difference between these two descriptions or titles that are given to this one uh, by the way satan is also mentioned in pergamos thyatira and philadelphia but the devil is only mentioned here so satan and devil are two words often used as, as synonymous but they actually do have different meanings uh, using different words conveying different senses so the, the word devil is used to convey the idea of someone who keeps on telling lies remember he's he's the father of lies and it's to do with with his slanderous uh, conduct telling lies about other people on the other hand the word satan simply means the enemy the adversary 
the one who opposes some other person. And so that's the basic difference between the two words. And so they are part, these Jews, of the synagogue of the adversary. And fear none of those things thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison. Now, how will the devil do that? Well, he is going to misrepresent the believers. He's going to lie about them. He's going to say they are disloyal to the empire. Uh, not because of the ceremony, but they're going to, he's going to twist that and say that these people, they, they're very disloyal, they're very uh, opposed to, to government and all of these things. And of course, the devil is very good at misrepresenting the people of God, and he's always doing it. And that's why, by the way, in Titus, it, it tells the, the older women not to be slanderers. And that word is don't don't be don't be devils, <laughs> don't be diabolos, don't be don't be doing the devil's work. He does a good enough job of speaking ill of God's people, uh, of mischaracterizing the people. And don't we see it in our society? It's kind of interesting how the devil has done such a good job at deceiving the whole world, and so that Christians are are now viewed by our society as evil. And the most perverse person in our culture is, is seen as good. I mean, we just come to that place, right? We're evil because we're narrow-minded, we're bigoted, you know, we're fundamentalists, we're all these terms. Uh, and on the other hand, uh, these, these people that are uh, just con constantly involved in wicked conduct, well, they're, they're the victims, really, of of these bigoted Christians, and they're they're really uh, people who can't help themselves. And you know the story, but but you see behind it all, we've got to see this: that behind all of this stuff is the devil. We've got to keep on remind, reminding ourselves who the real enemy is. Uh, again, it's not it's not Mister Trudeau. Uh, it's not his government. Uh, these people are victims of the enemy. The devil is behind all this. And, and, and the Lord wants them to know this. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison. Now, the devil wasn't there. You know, the typical picture, you know, wearing his red, uh, you know, pajamas and, uh, you know, kind of pitchfork. He wasn't literally there doing this, but he was behind the people who were doing this. And so... We, we see that it's good for them to realize who their real enemy was. And, and the Lord says, do not fear any of those things that you're about to go through. It's easy to say it, isn't it? <laughs> but uh, I'm sure at the time, the Lord gives grace. And I think we've got to keep reminding ourselves of this because we don't know what this is like really we 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 know what it is to a measure of rejection but not what these people suffered we 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 can't fully enter in and and we ask ourselves how would i do lord i don't know that i i feel like i'm a chicken how would i possibly do under those circumstances and yet i do believe the lord only gives grace sufficient when it's needed he doesn't give it in advance he gives it when it's needed and I believe when martyr's grace is needed, he will provide it. And so the Lord tells him, do not fear any of these things that thou shalt suffer. And then he tells him what they'll suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that you may be tried, and you shall have tribulation 10 days. Now, again, interesting things that he's telling them. They're going to go through a trial. But there's a limit to the trial. And he gives them this period of 10 days. Now, again... Uh, it can be 24-hour period, or it can sometimes a day refers to longer periods. Uh, <clears throat> so, for instance, we're in the day of grace right now. It's lasted longer than 24 hours. Praise the Lord for that. So whatever it's referring to, the point is the persecution has a limited time span. He wants them to know this. Yes, they're going to suffer. And it's going to be for a limited time, but there's an end in sight. It will come to an end. And, of course, for those that will suffer during this time, including death, well, what will happen to them? Compared to eternity, those 10 days will seem like nothing. <laughs> They're going to have an eternity 
of bliss in the presence of their savior. And so by comparison, uh, it will be seem like nothing. But it's good to know, isn't it, that the suffering they're going to go through is not going to last forever. A reward awaits them, in fact. He says, not only if you're faithful to death, not only, uh, I, of course, you're not going to be hurt at the second death. We're going to see that later. But, but you will receive a crown of life. And, of course, one of the great crowns that the Lord gives, rewarding his servants, what we call the martyr's crown, a crown that they will one day be able to cast at the feet of the Savior in worship, acknowledging that even the very courage to stand and not to deny him was given to them by him. And so a reward awaits a faithful life and a faithful death. You may have lost everything down here, but you have not lost your rich reward awaiting you in heaven. That's what the Lord wants them to know. And then in verse 11, he says, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He that overcomes shall not be hurt of the second death. These persecuted saints were poor, but they were rich. how could we apply this letter to ourselves? What we could say is this materialism and wealth can dull the spiritual senses. We, we know little of persecution in the Western church. For the most part, we're ignored and seen as irrelevant. In fact, if the truth be known, many of us don't even want to suffer reproach for the name of Christ unlike the apostles in the early church who rejoiced in Acts 5.41 that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. So the promise to the church here is that they may be able to destroy your body, but they will not be able to destroy the soul and body in hell. What he says is this, he that overcomes, remember, what does it mean to be an overcomer? It's faith, right? First John 5, verse 4 and 5. This is he that overcomes, the one that believes that Jesus is the Christ, has come in the flesh. And so the overcomer is the true believer. He shall not be hurt of the second death. So they will never, the enemy will never be able to destroy the soul and body in hell. That's not the experience of a child of God. There's something worse than being persecuted as a Christian. And that is not being a Christian at all. all right? That's worse. That's the worst case scenario, not being a Christian at all. Now, I want to give just a little warning here um, as we kind of bring this letter to a close. In verse 9, he talks about people who say they are Jews and are not, but they're the synagogue of Satan. You know, one of the great dangers of contemporary theology in our day is what is known as replacement theology. And replacement theology says that God has no future dealings with the nation of Israel, and the church has permanently replaced Israel as the people of God. And one of the problems with replacement theology is that people are saying they're Jews and they're not. <laughs> they're claiming the promises that belong to another people, Israel, not to them. And also, one of the direct results of it is anti-Semiticism from God's people. And replacement theology, and I can give you name your names, Martin Luther, great diatribe against the Jews. And we've mentioned before that Hitler preached Luther. He just took everything right out of Luther's playbook. Tragic that a man who was so used of God and yet blinded in this one area thought he was a Jew when he wasn't. Uh, he thought that they were replacing Israel. Uh, D. James Kennedy, greatly used in evangelism explosion, fierce anti-Semite, uh, terrible documents. You can read them online. 
of uh, him uh, saying we should have no dealings with Israel, should have no business dealings, should boycott Israel and all this stuff. And so just a warning here, dangers of replacement theology. Remember we said that there's a kind of catchphrase in all of these letters. Uh, we saw in the church at Ephesus, it was love and hate. Uh, and this one, we said it's poverty and riches. You're poor, but you're rich. Also, we, we said that there was a connection or allusions to the Old Testament. When we looked at Ephesus, we saw the Garden of Eden. Uh, we saw the Tree of Life. We, we, we saw uh, walking. We saw evil being present. Uh, we saw the, the threat of expulsion or removal. And so there was a lot of links there uh, to the Garden of Eden. Well, here, I want to suggest to you that the connection in uh, the church at Smyrna is really with the book of Exodus. Let me give you some examples. It was a time of great suffering for Israel in the Old Testament when they were in Egypt. In fact, they, weren't, they were just a family. They, they came out as a nation. But they suffered, but that suffering was limited. Remember, the Lord has said it was going to be 400 years, just like Smyrna, 10 days. And then remember, Pharaoh is a type of Satan. And again, who's behind this persecution? Well, it's the devil who's behind it. There were magicians in Exodus who would parallel the synagogue of Satan. The one who is the first and the last is the one who reveals himself to Moses as I am that I am. And so, again, there's parallels there. There's the second death and there's the angel of death that comes through the land of Egypt and kills all those that were not sheltered by the blood. And so there's parallels there. There's the one who was dead and is alive. The paschal lamb suffers death and yet crossing Red Sea pictures resurrection. And so it's just another interesting little uh, parallelism that we can see as we consider these portions of scripture. Now, I want to think about the persecuted church for a moment from a historical perspective, just in the few minutes that we have left. And many believe that thou will suffer these things 10 days, that there were 10 periods of Roman persecution under the Roman Caesars. And again, it was connected with this idea of Caesar being Lord and <laughs> these uh, various ones suffered uh, at the hands of these individuals who saw themselves as living deities. So I'll give you an example of, of one. Uh, uh, the words of uh, Tertullian, uh, he lived 155 to 240 AD in Carthage, which is modern-day Tunis in Tunisia, North Africa. And this is what he says, we render honor to Caesar as Caesar, but worship and prayer belong to God alone. Now, we said that Smyrna was the first place where a temple to Caesar was built called Dea Roma, 195 BC. So this is a story of Polycarp. And I'll just tell you this briefly, and then we'll end uh, our time this morning. But Polycarp lived from 69 AD to 155 AD, and he was from Smyrna. He was arrested in his 90s. The Roman official met Polycarp lifted him into his chariot and appealed to him to deny Christ. Surely he will forgive you. Polycarp's response is very telling. 86 years I have served him. He did me no wrong. How can I blaspheme or deny him? Isn't that lovely? 86 years I've served him. He did me no wrong. How can I blaspheme or deny him? He was thrown out with a chariot and his femur was broken as a result of the fall. He was taken to the stake. He asked not to be tied, as he was, would willingly die for the Savior. The wind blew the fire away from the old man's body. Then they pierced him with a spear, just like they did the Lord, and the blood and water which gushed forth put the fire out. Eventually they got their way, and they killed him. Tacitus was a contemporary with Nero. He described Christianity as a detestable superstition 
which at first was suppressed and afterwards broke out afresh and spread not only through Judea, the, the origin of the evil, but through the metropolis also, the common sewer in which everything filthy and flagitious, flagitious uh, marked by scandal and vice, meets and spreads. And again, if you think of the devil's lies, calling the Christian church the common sewer in which everything filthy and scandalous and full of vice spreads. So this was the persecution that the Christians endured. But they did it willingly. They did it because they loved the Lord Jesus who had done so much for them. And they were willing to serve him and even die for him. 86 years I've served him. He did me no wrong. How can I blaspheme or deny him? May the Lord give us great loyalty to Christ in our day. Amen.